And the good news is, and again, I just found this out this week, that there is an ongoing, very high quality, double-blind, randomized controlled clinical trial involving 348 people, all of whom are on Rebif, a two-year study, and they're given a very high dose, 14,000 IU of vitamin D per day. And this is ongoing already, so I don't know when we'll have that answer, but probably within a year, I guess, since the study's ongoing. So <clears throat> I think that's great. We have all these sort of, sort of the whole range of animal data, observational data, and then some, I guess, in conflict, randomized controlled clinical trials, but this should clarify everything for all of us. So what are people with MS supposed to do? It's a practical matter. Well, I'm definitely not going to tell you that there's a one-size-fits-all approach. This is, again, this is for you to decide, talking with your trusted healthcare provider, your neurologist. Um, I think it's reasonable for now to take vitamin D. I think their vi vitamin D deficiency is very common among people with MS. So at the very least, I think it's reasonable to have your vitamin D levels checked. And if it's deficient, as it often is, it obviously needs to be corrected. So deficient, what does that mean? A lot of times, and I don't expect that anyone here is familiar with these units, but 20 nanograms per milliliter or under, almost everybody would consider deficient. And then supplementation would be the easy fix for most people. A lot of people look at 30 nanograms per milliliter as sort of the bottom threshold for health. And then, again, you can supplement to get to that point. Um, and then there are other reasons, even if vitamin D isn't helpful for MS, and that very well may be, there are other reasons to do it. There are a lot of, a lot of observational data, and there are a few randomized controlled trials showing that people with low vitamin D are more likely to have depression. And obviously, low vitamin D is associated with bone health. So again, I think it's, the question isn't whether vitamin D is a good thing, it's for what purpose and what dose, and we don't have those answers entirely yet, but certainly I think it's reasonable for people to get tested and have deficiencies treated. So the usual range, toxicity occurs in your physician or other healthcare provider would know this, primary care physicians tend to know maybe even more than uh, neurologists on this, but 100 nanograms per milliliter would be sort of the upper end on uh, where toxicity is seen. So that's a pretty big range. And there's really no general agreement on what to do. How do you get to that? Well, you can kind of roughly figure that for every one, for every, um, let me see, 1,000 IU of vitamin D, you're going to increase your blood levels of 25 hydroxy vitamin D by 10 points. So most people taking Let's say 2,000 IU can assume that they're going to be about 3,000. Uh, sorry, 30 nanograms per milliliter. And if you're taking 4,000, maybe you can assume that you're around the 50 nanogram per milliliter range. But you really have to get tested to figure that out and then titrate accordingly. I already kind of covered this, but so the, the Food and Nutrition Board, that's the group that decides the RDA for different things, the adequate intake, and sort of what you see on your cereal boxes. They say that the maximum dose, the sort of the safe upper limit for vitamin D is 4,000 IU. And I think that's a conservative approach, but it's important to know it and to respect it. I think that it's, I don't know that there's ever been any established cases of toxicity, even up to 10,000 IU, but it's important to know that for most adults, it's 4,000 IU. And that seems like a, you should probably, if you're going to go above that, you should be testing your levels and doing it in consultation with the physician. Um, and how does it, why is it toxic? Because it would increase your levels of calcium. So that's the major way to measure. If you're taking a very high level of vitamin D, you should also be checking your calcium to make sure you're not hypercalcemic. Um, I think we covered the rest. So, um, five more minutes, okay. Well, I, have, I can do that. I want to come back to. Part two. Yes. I can talk about fish oil then. Talk about fish oil. Okay. So let's um, clarify some language here about fish oil. People talk very loosely about fish oil, omega-3, and I don't know if you've heard of EPA and DHA, right? 
So EPA, and again, you don't have to know this, maybe hear it once, it stands for something, like hexapentanoic acid, DHA stands for something, tocosahexanoic acid, but almost no one would ever use that. It says EPA in the bottles of fish oil. It says DHA on the bottle of fish oil. So fish oil is probably the richest source of omega-3 fatty acids and the two major omega-3 fatty acids, the so-called long-chain fatty acids, are EPA and DHA. So most fish oil contains about 30% inexpensive, not concentrated fish oil and there are different preparations. So most fish oil contains about 30% EPA and DHA. So if it's important as we go through these studies to understand if we're talking about EPA and DHA, that you're, that's what we're measuring, and it's different from the amount of fish oil in the capsule. And uh, what are the sources of this? Again, fatty fish, salmon, for example. If you want dietary sources, and um, eggs especially now, a lot of them uh, are, a lot of chickens are fed flaxseed now to increase their omega-3, the omega-3 fatty acid content of the eggs. So that becomes now a good source of omega-3 fatty acids. Um, so um, again, there's a whole kind of interesting story about fish oil in MS. And there, uh, again, I, I'm not going to go through it all in as much detail, but there's animal data, for example, there's observational data, but it's sort of been taken out of that realm already, and now it's um, uh, into the randomized controlled clinical trial range. So there was a very recent study too, so kind of hold on for that, and, um, but, but there was actually a study done, I think it was in 1989, um, that uh, I think is really, I, I relied upon it. I thought that this was good enough for the clinic. And you know, I think reasonable people can disagree, but when, when this was a randomized controlled clinical trial, so half of the group received what amounted to three grams of combined EPA and DHA. So that's a lot. If you're using inexpensive fish oil, that's nine grams, right? 30% roughly to get to the EPA and DHA that was used in this clinical trial. And you can see that there was a group who was given um, a diet richer in, everyone was told to increase their omega-6 fatty acids. That's a whole other top topic, like for example, uh, corn oil. And you can see that the people who were given the fish oil, the um, percentage of people who worsened by EDSS, that's the standard disability, stat, this way of measuring disability in clinical trials today, as done by neurologists, 42% of the group taking the fish oil worsened and 52% of the group on, this, on the, roughly on the placebo, actually they were given something, but. Um, so the problem with this study, why fish oil isn't a treatment for MS, isn't an established treatment for MS, is this p-value, and that's a, another kind of technical point that's worth knowing about. So that, what that means is point zero point zero seven means that this is a result, would have this result could be expected by chance one in 14 times. And so it may be, because of course if you compare two groups, one group's gonna do better than another, and it could be just by chance. Like if you're gonna flip a coin, it's gonna be heads or tails. And it doesn't mean the next time you do it, it's gonna be heads or tails. And the p-value is the tool for clarifying that issue. And in this case, it was p equals 0 0.07. And usually the standard for considering something proven is 0 0.05 fewer than one in 20 randomizations would produce the results just by chance. So it was close. So again, I think it goes back to what I was talking about earlier, I, I think, which is sort of a different mindset. I think patients look at it and say, well, it probably won't hurt me. And the physicians say, well, this isn't proof that it works. And sort of we kind of have that conversation that doesn't really, um, I mean, people are coming at it from uh, the Voltaire and uh, Pascal uh, perspectives. So this is an old study suggesting a benefit, and fish oil, again, is pretty safe and pretty ineffective, and pretty, pretty inexpensive. But now we've got a clinical trial to work with. So recently reported, um, about a month ago, I think, so it was a, a clinical trial of fish oil in MS. And you can see that the inner, so they had 92 people. The study lasted for two years. This is a randomized controlled double-blind study, so very high quality. 
And I, I didn't think to look who paid for it, because that's a major issue. If you've got a drug where somebody stands to make a lot of money, then it's reasonable for them to spend $50 million or something like that to do a high quality clinical trial. For something like this, you have to wonder, well, where did they get the money? Maybe from a government or from, uh, I think it was done in Sweden, maybe from a government there or, it's unclear to me. But anyway, we're very fortunate to have the data. Um, and you can see this was done with 1,350 milligrams of EPA and 850 milligrams of DHA, two grams of omega-3 fatty acids. And they were looking for um, change in gadolinium enhancing over six months as monotherapy. And they didn't find any effect. Again, unfortunately, it's still kind of on the small side, 92 people. FDA approved, I mean, phase three trials for FDA approved medications are going to involve 1,000 people. So, you know, but we're still very fortunate to have this. And here's the, the data. So basically, there was no effect found in this clinical trial. So there was no, so after six months of being of monotherapy versus placebo, there was no difference between the two groups. And then at six months, everyone was put on beta seron and continued taking either placebo or fish oil for another 18 months. And so it's it's very clear. Even the authors say there really wasn't even a trend because it is small. But again, you can kind of look for trends. Is there? Does it look like there's a benefit for the group taking fish oil? And the statisticians and the authors said no. Um, but you can see here, this is, this is a graph. You can see the lower line. Is the, this is the number of new lesions on MRI. And the people on the fish oil sort of seems like they're starting to do better over time. Maybe that's me just kind of wishful thinking. The bottom line is there was definitely no proof that there was any benefit to the fish oil. Um, this was powered, technically, to measure a 70% effect of fish oil, which is pretty large. So I guess the way I interpret this is that either the effect is very small or non-existent. And here you're very low for a group like this, a small group of people on beta seron. But these, these lines are essentially superimposed. So can I stop there, Karen, and let you move on? Or? Finish talking about fish oil, and then we'll go on. Okay, because <laughs> I can do this all day. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so, so what about what about this? What does this mean for whether this is a reasonable thing for people with MS to do? And I think that the answer is, again, talk to your healthcare provider. There are specific problems for some people with fish oil who have underlying underlying coagulopathies, or there are certain things to think about. Um, but in general, it could be a reasonable choice, even though there's certainly no definitive evidence that it helps with MS. In fact, it appears not to. So, but there are there is a lot of data suggesting that fish oil can help with depression, which is one of the most common and most debilitating symptoms people with MS experience. So there have been five recent meta-analysis, that's a study of studies looking at randomized controlled clinical trials. Four of the five found that fish oil was effective as an antidepressant. And I think that there's, you know, and, and this is unclear, but if it's effective as an antidepressant, perhaps it could prevent depression in those who even aren't depressed. There's sort of one possibility, and that is just speculation. But um, again, we're talking about something that's relatively safe. And um, so the FDA has evaluated fish oil for safety and has determined that up to um, two grams of EPA and DHA, that's not fish oil again, right, is safe on a daily basis for the general population. So I think that becomes a reasonable basis, and that's very similar to what has been used in these studies and in the studies of depression, too. So I think that's a reasonable choice for people who want to do it. There, again, we talk, I talked a little bit about this, that there is an increased risk of bleeding tendencies, especially with people who have underlying bleeding abnormalities. And it also can um, minimally reduce vitamin E in the body. So to take a small vitamin E supplement, if you're going to be doing high-dose fish oil supplementation for a long time, is a reasonable thing to do also. Okay? okay. All right. Okay. Thanks, Catherine.